Today we are once again taking a look at some Montreal Canadian trade rumors, some different players that might find themselves on the move. Today we're looking at guys like Arturi Lekkinen, we're also looking at a guy like Jeff Petrie, even newcomer Christian Devore. Could they all be moved as part of the trade deadline or offseason moves? Plus we have more news from the NHL waiver wire, and a former NHL player has pled guilty to sexual assault. Another messy bad luck for the hockey world. We'll discuss all that coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a variety of things to talk about, mostly Montreal Canadian stuff. But before we do that, a couple quick other uh, news items to, to look at here quickly. One is the NHL waiver wire, uh, which involves Alex Stalock, the Edmonton Oilers goaltender, who was on waivers yesterday, uh, which is basically to get his contract uh, back to be able to play in NHL or AHL games after being off for, I believe it was about a year and a half. Uh, he did indeed clear, so he can be assigned now to their American Hockey League affiliate. And you can't help but wonder with the goaltending situation there. Um, we had no Mike Smith out again. Uh, Stuart Skinner is going to be up there with Koskinen. If Koskinen, you know, doesn't continue to, to play well or what have you, be interesting to see if Stalock might get in a, an opportunity uh, later on in the season to play any games. But uh, we'll see where that goes. But at least he's able to play after the the bout with Mayo Cardinal. It's at least to know, good to know that he's able to come back. And we also had some more disturbing news uh, in terms of another hockey player uh, having a situation where he had. He pled guilty to sexual assault. Now, this is something that happened a long time ago, but of course the victim didn't come forward until more recently. Uh, and it involves Reed Boucher, who is a former NHL player, originally drafted uh, by the New Jersey Devils, spent a long time in their organization, was also part of the Vancouver Canucks organization for a while, and is currently playing over in Russia in the KHL. Uh, he was accused uh, by uh, his former Billet family's daughter. So kind of like and you're normally when you live with a Billet family, a lot of them refer to their you know other kids in the house as their Billet siblings or their Billet brothers or sisters or whatnot. Uh, but essentially his Billet sister, I guess, is what they refer to in the article um, as, as who the victim was. She was only... 12 years old at the time. He was 17 as part of a USA Hockey's program. Uh, it's certainly another terrible situation. But, of course, with everything we've seen in recent months of the other cases that have been made public, it's certainly giving, uh, you know, certainly more people and victims more courage to speak up. Essentially, what happened there, you know, there was a situation back in 2011 when it did happen. It did reach back to USA Hockey, but it sounds like, from what I can tell, that the victim themselves never even really came forward to police at that point or told her family even much of anything. Uh, it sounded basically what happened was that the victim had told friends, uh, and their friends told their parents, and then the parents ended up going to USA Hockey. Now, uh, this was originally reported on by the uh, Free Press in Michigan, uh, but it's been picked up and additional work has been done by Katie Strang, who requests had both of the Athletic and TSN respectively. Uh, of course, who both do a lot of investigative work in the sports world and have been involved with a lot of other high profile cases here lately. Uh, you know, for example, like we've seen uh, when it comes to the Chicago Blackhawks. Now, when it comes to the story, uh, essentially the only thing that was done by USA Hockey is he was removed from the home. And that's it. He ended up playing in a U18 tournament mere weeks later. It looks like there was no discipline of any kind. They just kind of removed him from the uh, from the, from the victim and probably helped pl place him somewhere else. I don't really know exactly what transpired after that, but it, it's kind of really disgusting to, to think that nothing again was done. Um, same kind of situation involved with the Blackhawks and the whole Kyle Beach saga and what took place there back in 2010 uh, with the video coach. I mean, he also had done work for USA Hockey as well. Connection there. And, you know, yeah, you have to think that really there needs to be more investigative work done uh, in that area to see what in the heck was going on back then and why none of this stuff gets reported to police. There seriously needs to be uh, major changes there. Uh, the other part of this that's not really overly great is he was a, Reed Boucher in this particular case, was originally charged with first-degree criminal sexual conduct, which can carry a 25-year-to-life sentence. Uh, the judge agreed to a lesser charge with no upfront jail time, which is essentially like a third-degree uh, scenario. Uh, and that's where he ended up pleading guilty to. Sentencing is currently set for January the 31st. So I'm not sure exactly what this is going to mean for his career in the KHL. I don't know if he's going to be sent back to the States to do jail time. I, I don't really know how that's going to work out because we don't even know 
what the sentence is yet, but it's certainly, I would imagine, very real possibility could impact his his career, and it should. I mean, this guy made a major, major mistake, but it did say as well because of the fact that he was 17 at the time uh, that if he uh, successfully finishes his sentence, which sounds like it's going to be light by the looks of things, um, that he won't even be on his record because of the age that he was at the time. So, I mean, obviously there's public knowledge and there's, you know, the court of public opinion that will certainly likely come down on him, but won't really impact it when it comes to anybody doing like a criminal record check or background check or anything of that nature, which is really, really wrong considering what he did with a 12 year old. I mean, he was 17. I know in all intents and purposes, you're still a minor, but you're still very much way more mature and should be, you know, have a good enough head on your shoulders to know what you're doing is extremely, extremely wrong. And not only was he, what he was doing was really wrong for a variety of reasons, not only were her age, she wasn't consenting, uh, the relationship and all that. There's so many things that are bad and wrong about this, but it sounds like it happened on, on uh, multiple occasions where situations occurred and he was kind of blackmailed her and to keep doing it. It was, it sounded absolutely horrific. I will put a link to the story. Uh, there's a couple of them. The one from the free press in uh, Michigan, I believe, is on behind a paywall. You can't really see a whole lot, but the audio found another article talking about it, uh, which is not behind a paywall. So I'll link that one in the pinned comment if you want to see more details on the story. I, I will warn you, though, depending on what you want to know or not know about the situation, there are some details that are kind of graphic and, uh, you know, another disgusting situation uh, from the hockey world, which is... You know, stuff. I hope we can stop finding out about this stuff. We really need to clean up the culture as that very much work needs to continue uh, to have that happen. Now, we're going to transition now to the main topic of the video today, which we're going to focus on some Montreal Canadiens trade chatter. Now, this is all uh, kind of information that's coming from a variety of sources here, so we're going to talk about this a little bit. Uh, one, of course, we know Ben Chirot, uh pretty much a guarantee to be traded by Montreal. Uh, every time you really see any kind of trade rumor, trade bait list from all the different outlets out there, he's always near the top, or at least you know, in the top probably five or so, because it's pretty much a given he's going to go. So we know that. We've seen several teams linked to this player. Um, so there's no doubt he's going to move. Uh, but some of the newer ones that we haven't really talked about a lot and which most of this other information comes from some of it's from the athletic when it comes to Arturi Lekanen and the rest of them in Klingberg and Dvorak and uh, Petrie stuff is all from uh, TVL Sports and it's certainly some interesting spin from that media outlet. Now, when it comes to Lekanen, like I said, uh, Arthur Staple, who covers the New York Rangers now, former Islanders coverage. He covered the Islanders for a long time and then transitioned over to the Rangers here recently. Um, had a piece in The Athletic talking about a lot of different Ranger trade targets heading closer to the deadline. Went over a variety of options for top six, top nine centers, wingers, some defensemen they might target, etc., etc. But one of the names that came up that he really recommended that the Rangers look into was Arturi Lekin in the Montreal Canadiens. Wouldn't come at a huge cost. A guy who can play up and down your lineup. Uh, you know, you can put him in the top six if you uh, need to, but probably, you know, better suited for like a third line role where he can kill penalties, good four checker, uh, you know, and be a more versatile type of player. Uh, he's going to need a new contract moving forward so you can kind of determine what that looks like. You know, maybe you negotiated a, a small extension with him, hard to say, or, or maybe you wait. It, it's Either way, it's, it's a huge uh, possibility that he might be a player they zone in on, but at the same time, it's not somebody who's going to cost a ton, which is the reason why Staple was looking at this as a real possibility, given the fact that we know Jeff Gordon's going to go through this roster and kind of determine what core pieces he wants to continue to build around who does he see as being longer-term solutions with this team? And, of course, he also references in the article that it's not a guarantee that Lekkonen won't be one of the guys that Gordon decides to keep around, that he may not be traded. There has been some talk that there has been some early uh, negotiations, although probably not a lot will happen until they get their new GM in place because I'm sure the amount of work on Jeff Gordon's desk right now is really a big pile that he's trying to handle without a lot of support around him as he continues to round out the staff. But there is some talk, to the, there's been some early negotiations around a potential Lekkonen extension. So there's no guarantee he moves. But should Montreal go down that road, which is possible, given the fact that he said he's not, you know, a piece you would consider to be absolutely untouchable. Uh, he's not, you know, not old, but he's not super young either. Like kind of at that middle of the road 20s, you know, stage where you either extend them longer term 
or you could cut bait. So it kind of depends on where you go. And also depends on what the return price is going to be as well, right? So there's, uh, you know, the, the jury's out whether or not he is signed or Return now. When it comes to the, the information from Tibia Sports, a couple of different articles I referenced. One was around Christian Dvorak and just basically going on how he has not fit in. Uh, this trade is looking poorly right now. Of course, Bergman made that deal. He's no longer there. But essentially, they uh, I wouldn't call it a panic trade, but because they had time to think about this. But certainly after the Emmy offer sheet came in with Carolina, they had time to decide if they were going to match or not. We knew they likely were not going to. At least that was the general consensus, which turned out to be true. Um, and, of course, they were going to be getting some good compensation return in the way of a first-round pick. And, of course, they used that to acquire Christian Dvorak from Arizona. Now, of course, Dvorak came with a bit of term, but not a ton of money, not an expensive contract. He was viewed upon as kind of a lighter version, if you will, of Patrice Bergeron. Not exactly to that level, but the same sort of two-way center. Uh, somebody who can kill penalties, good on face-offs, tough to play against, but also chip in a decent amount offensively. You know, still in his mid-20s. So, you know, still on the younger side of things. And overall, I think a lot of people looked at what he did in Arizona and said, okay, that could be a good fit, good replacement, because without Cock and Yemi, now you're going to suddenly be a little thin at center, especially after losing Philip Deneau to free agency. Uh, so they went from being a team a few years ago that were really weak at the center position to suddenly having a much better depth chart, you know, when it comes to the emergence of Suzuki, the emergence of Cock and Yemi, although I wouldn't say the emergence was really strong, but still, he did play some center for them. Of course, Philip Deneau had been there, uh, you know, and they were suddenly in a much better spot that way. Well, all of a sudden, two of those three guys no longer present. So trading for Dvorak was out of necessity, but just like Cock and Yemi was draft it because of his position which at this point i think we can all agree at least i hope montreal fans can agree was indeed a mistake if you look at the options that they had and even taking a guy like brady kachuk there's just no way that i think if they had a do-over that they would make the same boo-boo or not i mean to me at least you, you wouldn't think right but either way it doesn't matter it's all said and done a few years ago cock and Yemi's moved on now they have dvorak so they had that Top three pick, which turned out to be Kakaniemi. Kakaniemi leaves. They turned that into another first rounder coming back, which turns it to Christian Dvorak. And now things have not worked out. He's not really had a good season at all. He's battled some injuries. Uh, I know his plus minus is terrible, which really isn't the end of the world. That's certainly affected by the team's play as well. But really, there's a lot of nights that he just hasn't really looked like he's really, ha you know, there's, there's not a lot of positive coming out of his game right now. So you have to really question whether or not Jeff Gordon sees uh, you know, a player that he wants to keep around. He may have to sell uh, on that player um, low when the value is low and not even get back the return that they gave up. Now, thankfully, with that first-round pick, they gave the Habs two first-rounders. They have the Montreal pick, that, of course, their own, and the Carolina one from the Kakanyemi compensation. So at least with the conditions on the trade was that they get the higher of the two picks unless one or both are top 10 lottery picks. So at this point, it's pretty much a given guarantee that the Habs will be in the lottery and will picking pretty high. So that means that they then the condition switches to the lower of the picks. So that would get them the Carolina pick. Montreal will keep their own, which will be the higher one, and they will still have a high first-round pick. Thankfully, they have two. Or if they would have given up their first-rounder for Dvorak, and not had one in the season they're having, it would be that much more of a disaster. But at least, you know, they're picking, um, you know, likely it's going to be a high pick. We know that where it's going to be. We won't know for a while. But when it comes to the Carolina pick, Carolina's having a pretty solid season, expected to possibly have a deep playoff run. That might be, you know, somewhere between 25 to 30, 31. It's hard to say where it'll be, right? But it's going to be really late. So given the... You know, the draft and where it's at with, it, with its depth and everything that's expected, I would think that, um, you know, it, it, it's not a huge deal not to have that pick if they can get the right return. But at the end of the day, Dvorak, based on the TV media, they really feel he should be moved out and has not worked out at all. All. So, of course, I want to know from Habs fans who watch the games a lot closely and probably have seen a lot of this player this year, what are your thoughts on Dvorak? Do you think he's a player that Gorton keeps around, or do you see him being trade bait? Like, we've talked about a lot of other guys, the possibility of, like, Toffoli going, Anderson, Gallagher. I think there's, there's not much there that's what you'd call untouchable. The only ones that are kind of considered in that category really are, like, Suzuki, Caulfield, and I know Caulfield's having a, a bad year, 
but they're not ready to give up on him just yet. Uh, obviously, a guy like Romanov wouldn't be in there, Caden Gooley, and there wouldn't be much else. I think anything else is possible depending on the deals. And, of course, a lot of that really boils down to contracts. There's so many other semantics there that it's hard to say. But the other thing on TVS Sports was they're suggesting a Jeff Petrie for John Klingberg trade. Now, uh, this is, you know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense if you think about it. Now, if Montreal could get that deal done and get Klingberg extended for a decent price, then maybe. But Klingberg's 29 years old. Does it really make sense if they're going to be going through a rebuild to sign or trade and extend a player of that caliber? Now, if they could obviously unload Petrie, who's, you know, four to five years older with a decent amount of term and a, you know, good sized ticket there too. Maybe I'm not sure they really get too further ahead, but I guess the problem we know Petrie's having a down year like a lot of the team, and if Montreal could move him, I think they would ser- certainly seriously consider that at this point in time. And would would Dallas want him? 34 years old, another player that's you know got a decent amount of money in term. I just I don't think so. I mean, if he was a cheaper contract and less term, maybe. But uh, you know, obviously Klingberg's looking for like eight million or better. He makes less than that. Could give you similar numbers if they're both playing to their full potential. But I just don't know. I mean, the Stars have enough players that are older and on longer-term deals that haven't worked out. They seem to be reluctant to give Klingberg the contract because of that. Like because They're not happy with the Ben and Sagan contracts, which is a big reason why they don't want to give Klingberg the term and the money. They've already committed to Heskinen. They have Lindell on their contract longer term. They signed Ryan Suter for four years. Like, you know, it just all the money kind of got eaten up. And when you look at the other guys that are not working out in the longer term deals, I understand why Jim Neal's a little gun shy here to keep Klingberg in the mix, even though he's been a good soldier for them and put up some good stats in the past. But at this point, he's not having a great season either. So really hard to say where things go. But as much as this trade to me just does not make sense, I saw the uh, the article uh, in uh, on TVS Sports, and I, I want to discuss it here because I really want Montreal fans' opinion on this. I just don't see it making sense, really, for either side. In the ca- case of the Habs, they can wait and sign Klingberg as a free agent if they really are interested. But at the same time, you know, if they give up Petrie's contract, would make sense if they in a, in a way too. But I just don't see Dallas doing that either. So as much as it might sound interesting. I, I don't see it happening at all. But I'd like to know if you're the GM, which who we don't know who's going to be yet, would you do that deal? Now, quick update on the Montreal GM scenario as well. One of their candidates, Matthew Darsh, is also very much in the mix for the Anaheim Ducks GM job. He is expected to be interviewing up there shortly. So if he's not offered the position in Montreal, he could go there. Um, or depending on how long the Habs take and Gorton takes to complete round two of interviews and make a decision, I don't know if the Ducks will come to a conclusion any sooner or not, but that certainly could have an impact on whether or not uh, he accepts a job in Montreal, they offer to him, etc. But we'll see where that goes. Round two of interviews are expected to start this week, as I mentioned yesterday. Guys like Darsh and Briere are expected to still be in the mix. There's some talk about Roberto Luongo or Patrick Wall being in the mix too, but we don't know that for certain. Um, I think that's less likely, but... There are some out there that think they are, and at the same time, uh, you know, uh, we'll probably won't know for another week or more before a decision is made. So let me know your thoughts on all this potential Habs rumors and all this talk on these articles down below in the comments, and we'll discuss further. If you're new to this channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the latest news, rumors, and analysis on all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Uh-huh.